Welcome to Foundations for Life with myself, Mike Clayton, and of course, Barry Phillips. Eh, we didn't get dressed in the same closet today, at least. Hey, you know, not everybody can wear the same thing. That's true. Yeah, I, uh, the, the twinsies thing just doesn't get over with me. So, <laughs> hey, Barry, before we get going, um, I do have a favor to ask of our listeners. Uh, some good friends of mine in Israel, the Waller family, uh, they are the founders of Hayavel. Uh, Tommy and Sherry just had uh, their 41st grandchild. Can you imagine that, Barry? 41st. 41, yeah. Last week it was 40, this week it's 41. Oh, my goodness. No, I yeah, cannot imagine. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, but uh, they're in Israel. <clears throat> they're responsible for helping the vineyard owners, the farmers, and so many things that they have their hands into. Uh, one of their sons, Brett, and his wife uh, just had a uh, uh, a child last just a, a few days ago. I believe it was a boy. I can't remember all the details on that. But uh, there was some complications with the birth. Had to take the had to take her to uh, for emergency surgery. And uh, there is a, an outstanding bill. Israel works a little different in their medical services than we do here in the United States. But uh, Brett does a lot of the logistics for Hayavel. Uh, wonderful young man. I've known him for many years. And so if anyone out there could give some help in there, this it's about a, a $15,000 bill. There's, uh, as of this morning, about $5,500 that's been coming in for that. But uh, if anyone could give some help, they can go to my website, my uh, my Facebook page, and uh, or it's on Go Send something. I can't remember what it is. Go, uh, they can uh, send me an email. Yeah. Huh? Go ahead. Yeah. So they can send me an email. I'll be glad to send them the direct link. So just a little little help there would sure be appreciated. It's not about one person doing everything. It's about all of us doing what we can. So uh, with that very uh, question here uh, this morning is, is evil sin or is sin evil or does one lead to another or how do we look at this thing? What's the difference between the two words of sin and, or as you would say in Grassy Creek, sin, sin. and um, sin. Okay. Yeah, I know we were trying to teach Hanok that uh, it's, it's difficult <laughs> to teach uh, Hanok some, some of the things, but he was, he was getting it down. So sin and evil uh, what's the difference between those two words, Barry? I thought you were going to answer that, and then I was going to offer commentary. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, okay. Well, this this stems from um, a conversation I had last week uh, with a brother out of our congregation. Uh, we were discussing last week's uh, Foundations for Life. And out of that conversation, he asked a simple question, is evil just sin, or is it a special greater category of sin? Is all sin necessarily evil? And that has been kind of stirring in my pot ever since, and I'm pondering that. So, mm. uh, Reldon, this is for you. And yeah. uh, hopefully we can get an answer. I don't know. Yeah, I tend we, uh, to think we, that Reldon, sin, we can probably get a better a better answer on the golf course next time I see you. So that's yeah, you know, that's well, always a place of revelation. Yes, yes, that is true. While you're in the woods looking for a little ball, uh, go ahead, <laughs> kneel and pray. Uh, yeah. Um. I tend to think, and I, you know, I don't know that I can prove this scripturally, but what comes to my mind, Mike, is that uh, that sin is um, it can be as simple as a lie, mm -hmm. uh, as some means of deception. It can be, you know, uh, taking something that um, doesn't belong to you. And the Torah, there seems to be a difference between um, intentional sin and unintentional sin. Mm -hmm. So if we violate the Torah, even if our culture permits us to do so, 
it's still according to Yah a sin. Right. So let's let's no. let's offer a categorical situation here. Okay. And the especially in the southern part of America, eating unclean meat is pretty much a given that people do that all the time and never think Standard. twice about it because doctrinally we've been taught uh he called all things clean and mm -hmm. uh if we pray over it we should be thankful for it and not refuse anything and then there's peter's vision of the unclean unclean animals and so forth so all foods are clean yeah so we have been taught. definition of the word food is is where we'd have to go to to really yeah. unpack that we won't do it today absolutely and you're right however there are many God-fearing, God-loving, upright, otherwise people that would eat that which is unclean, which the scriptures declare is not for us and a sin. It's a violation of the Torah, 1 John 3, 4. Uh, is that evil? Eating a bacon cheeseburger, is that evil? Having ham for dinner, is that evil? Or is it merely a sin? I tend to believe that it is a sin, but not necessarily that which falls in the category of being evil. Okay. Okay, I, I got you. Um, l l let me take it back to the first time the word evil is used in Scripture is in Bereshit, Genesis, uh, where it says that the commandment is you are to eat of every tree except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that's where we see that tree uh, or that word coming forth is in relationship to that tree. Um, I guess to further this, we'd have to go to the definition of what sin is. So the, the, the main definition is, of sin is to miss the mark. So if we consider a bullseye, and anyone that's ever been out uh, with archery or or uh, you know firearms or anything like that, you've got a bullseye, and your goal is to hit that bullseye. If you miss that bullseye, uh, biblically, that's called sin. Uh, in firearms, it's called being a bad shot. In uh, hunting, it's called being a vegetarian. <laughs> okay, but uh, so you had to if, go there. <laughs> well, I almost got you with that coffee in your bag. <laughs> I, I, I looked down at the computer just at the wrong time because I could uh, I could have gotten you on that one. Uh, so if we if we consider that the word sin is is missing the mark, then could we consider that sin will lead us to or sin has the ability to lead us to evil. Okay. When yes, the, the evil was present, the tree in the garden was present. There was, there was nothing that Adam and Hava, Adam and Eve were able to do. They, they were not told they could go over and, and take a, 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 an ax to the tree and chop it down. Uh, they couldn't uproot it and take it to a different place outside the garden. It was going to be, it, it had a permanent place. And in fact, it had a, a permanent uh, purpose, and that was the testing of their love for the Almighty. So the evil is there. It was the sin which was missing the mark called disobedience, which led to them in taking partaking in that evil mm -hmm. Mm. Mm -hmm. i was hoping you'd say more well <laughs> i'm at the end i'm, in. <laughs> I'm at the end of thought <laughs> well seeing you're my elder i i want to make sure i don't interrupt you uh, <laughs> first john i mentioned for this moment ago first john three four says according to scriptures translation everyone doing sin also does lawlessness Sin is lawlessness, mm -hmm. or uh, I think the King Jimmy says transgression of the law, 
We know that that word law there is referencing the Torah. Yeah. The Torah, Rob Shaul, the Apostle Paul taught us, the Torah teaches us what sin is, which was a great relief to me about 20 some years ago when I realized that just because I violate the do's and don'ts of the denomination that I've been a part of, which could be um, quite extensive. Uh, I grew up thinking that if I wore my high school class ring, I was sinning. Yeah. Um, that everything that my denomination said was a sin was not necessarily scripturally a sin. Mm -hmm. And so when someone was saying, well, you're returning to the bondage of the law, I've never been freer in my life because now I have clear delineation of what sin is. And I don't have to wonder if I'm violating some, um, some groups, uh, code or, or list of rules of do's and don'ts, I can go to the Word, and the Word will tell me what sin is. And, and the wonderful thing about that, just to, to butt in here since I'm the elder, uh, <laughs> the wonderful thing about that, Barry, is it doesn't change. No, it doesn't. Okay, go ahead. So, um, I'm trying to get you with that coffee cup. No, right. no I'm going to leave the coffee cup alone <laughs> until you uh, for a little bit here. In Micah 3, or yeah, Micah 3, uh, it references in verse 2, you who are hating good and loving evil. It's evil not just walking sinfully, but walking simply in such a way as that you turn your back on that which is good and hate it. Mm -hmm. Um. Romans chapter one. I'm, I'm trying not to preach here, but in Romans, ha, ha, take an offering. In chapter number one, uh, it talks about those that have, um, uh, that they not only, um, I'm looking for it here. You'll find it. It's just one chapter. Yeah, well, it, it references not only did they go into their sin, but they mm -hmm. they applauded or encouraged yeah. those who did so. Yeah. Um, I'll find it here in a second. I'm reading through this real quick, uh, but it's it's to be is 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 the evil part of sin the category where Yah releases us beyond his normally installed boundaries. You're on your own now and your sinful ways. I am no longer going to impede your progress with my grace or my mercy. You're on your own. Okay. So I, I guess we got to go back to definitions once again. Uh, what is the definition of evil? Um, same thing as the definition of, we go to the definition of light and dark. What is dark? Uh, dark is the absence of light. Yes. It's really all it is. I mean, you know, you, you want to, to change darkness, you turn on a light. So darkness is not an entity of itself, though it is a created aspect. We see that in Genesis chapter one. But darkness is the absence of light. Evil is the absence of good, or we could say the absence of Elohim, God. So is sin. You know, if we come into this 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 world uh, filled with good, um, the sin, then begins to separate us from his presence and that separation from his presence the result of that is evil works okay evil I'm deeds i'm thinking as you were talking about darkness is the absence of light 
there was a point in the creation order where darkness was the default estate. But once okay. light was introduced, then creation had to choose to walk in darkness. Think about it this way. Yeshua coming as the light. Mm -hmm. um, once the light shows up, you no longer have to def walk in the default of darkness because the default has changed. The default with Yeshua went from darkness to light. Now the default is light unless you choose to turn from the light and walk in darkness. Mm -hmm. That's evil. Those who are choosing to walk in the light still at times need to repent. Sin happens. Maybe we should have a T-shirt that says sin happens. <laughs> I don't know. It does. Uh, yeah. Intentionally or unintentionally. Not that I would wear one, but I mean, we would sell a bunch. Uh, sin does happen, and we do need to make teshuva and turn from it, even when we're trying to walk in the light. It shouldn't, but it does. But I don't have to choose to walk in darkness. To choose darkness over the estate of being in the light would be a choice for evil. As Micah says, you're hating the mm -hmm. good, the light, and you're choosing to love the darkness. Mm -hmm. So uh, Yeshua, in, in speaking about that, in John or Yochanan 3, verse 19 and following, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light. They That's evil for their works were wicked. I think wicked and evil are good synonymous terms. Everyone who is practicing evil matters hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed, but the one doing the truth comes to the light so that his works are clearly seen, that they have been wrought in Elohim. So again, this, this text says that those who are practicing evil, mm -hmm. that greater category of simple walk, hates the light. That's what Micah 3 2 says. So, is evil then hating, not just refusing to walk in light, but hating the light? Well, if we did your uh, your t shirt there, we could put on the, you know, the front of it, we could put a little logo that says uh, sin happens. And on the back, it would say, evil is the result. Somebody will take our idea and make a lot of money. There you go. There you Remember go. Remember where to send your tithes and offerings. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when you know, let, let's take the United States, for example. Um, and I have, I, I, I don't have the opinion. Well, let me, let me back up and rephrase that one again. The founding of this country was, in my mind, no doubt, orchestrated by the Almighty. Agreed. Um, those that would say that the founding of this country is uh, in total righteousness, I don't think have read a lot of the history that has happened. Uh, that being said, there was a time period, at least on the surface, that the United States looked like a godly nation. Now, once again, I would have to go back to some history and and see that there was there, that there's always been an underlining uh, an underlying level of sin and debauchery. But you know, the generation that you and I grew up in, uh, people were going to church. They were, uh, you know. Uh, leading a somewhat, it, it appeared, godly life. But there came a time, uh, I believe it was 1964, when prayer was taken out of schools. Uh, and, and that's, you know, organized prayer 
can be taken out of school. If you have a if you have a final exam, there's still prayer in school. Okay, uh, you can't take that one out. But when prayer was taken out, when this whole uh, lie of the separation of church and state, which is not in the Constitution, <laughs> but rather in the um, in, in the the Communist Manifesto, okay. But when all of those things started to take hold, uh, the United States began to enter into a time of sin, which has led to a time of evil. Did did I I lay out history halfway decent there? Yeah, you probably make at least a B in class. Okay, okay. Well, that'd be one of the first ones I got. (laughs) I don't want to see your report card. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have them. My mother kept them for some reason. <laughs> yeah. uh, my uh, my my daughter actually saw those one day, and she said, "Dad, how do you get, how do you fail PE?" <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's difficult. <laughs> oh well, okay. So Barry, here's the thing. I doubt there's a listener out there that we have today that is wanting to walk in evil. Uh, I doubt there's even uh, one of our listeners that wants to walk in sin. So let's tie something that that was kind of a uh, uh, quandary of the Torah portion this week. Actually, I just before we got online, I had a little conversation with a, a friend of mine in Israel. It wasn't Hanok. Um, I have more than one friend in Israel, but um, it's it in this week's Torah portion we see the uh, the commandment. Okay, the last week's Torah portion was Taruma, uh, bring anyone who wholeheartedly wants to bring a gift. This week is in order to bring the olive oil, and is to it says to keep the lamp, the menorah, burning continually. But then it says that. Um, that this is to be a um, the, a testimony and keep it burning. The 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 Aaron and the sons are to put it in the tent of meeting outside the curtain in front of the testimony, and keep it burning from evening until morning before you have Ave. So my question to this friend of mine was: Was it? It, it seems like a contradiction here. So how how do you explain those two things? That is that, I, that has been a question of mine as well. How does it burn continually, but it don't it burns from evening to morning? Okay. And you would might assume, well, during the daylight hours it's not burning. Mm-hmm. But to That's, me, that I, was... I, I think it, it suggests that um it is tended in such a way as it is able to burn all night long. Mm-hmm. But there is a point in time where it I don't think they they trimmed the wicks and filled the cups and then just said, "Well, wait until nightfall and then we'll light it again." Mm-hmm. I think they lit that, it that, that, as well. Yeah, that tends to be the the perception here of uh, and here's the the statement I got back. It has to be continuously lit, but it has to be seen to. And so my statement back regarding this was that evening to morning. Um, was this is a time that, of course, a, a time of rest uh, in the evening, a, at night, we rest, we sleep. And so that it needed to be tended to, to make sure that that light was going to burn during the time of darkness, during the time of our rest, that even in our times of rest, even when it is dark around us, and maybe specifically during those times, we need to make sure that we tend to the light that is in us. Mm -hmm. Another uh, similar situation is concerning the the fire at the brazen altar. It is not to go out. Mm -hmm. It has to burn constantly. 
I've always thought, I may be by those who would study more of the de deeper protocols of temple or tabernacle um, procedures. I've often thought though that there was a fire watcher, a Levi Levite, whose job was to add fuel to the fire during the night hours. Mm -hmm. Like it's uh, it's an easy correlation uh, to make to think of those that have wept through the night. Yeah, uh, those dear dear ones of Yah that have spent many a night hour on their knees or on their face before Him, crying out. You know, we we have uh, in recent weeks we have seen an outbreak of. I call it revival. You know, you can you can debate back and forth whether you think it justifies as or or qualifies as revival or not. And uh, there are those that say, "Well, it doesn't meet my qualification list." When to, to it, them, I would Barry. To them, I would have to say, you you can't judge revival. You can judge the fruit later on. Yes. Okay, and, and this is, you know, for a group of young people to be spending time in worship, that's revival. Now, what is the fruit going to be? Uh, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. I pray it's good. Uh, I mean, that would, why would anybody go? There are people, there. I got, I got you off, off subject there, I'm sorry. There are people that are actually speaking against this. How in the world can you speak against? I, I, I may want to discern what's going on, but how can you speak against a group of, of young people that are worshiping? Really? Well, it's a life. The biggest, the biggest uh, negative is well, there's no preaching. We have had preaching okay. ad nauseum for how many, you know, over and over and over again. There, there will be a point, I think, where, you know, and I don't know that there, you know, when we talk about these students, they are in a Christian school where it was birthed out and they were studying the word constantly. You know, they were having chapel services three times a week where they were hearing the word. They had just heard the word when this, this event began to break out. So this is not word ignorant people, you know, and, and who knows what word and what understanding of the word. The, the, if you want to kill a revival, start throwing your doctrines in. Yeah, your wet blanket doctrines. So, you know, let's, let's just be easy there. Where I was going with that is this event, this current thing that is taking place did not just happen. But it would be an answer to the prayers of generations. Mm -hmm. you think, well, somebody's mom and dad was praying at home, or maybe there was some staff and faculty that were praying, Father, move on this on these children. Who knows how many generations of prayer that it has taken to birth something? We think that prayer can be, you know, we we can get a prayer agenda started and after a few months of this, Yah will finally move and answer our prayer. We don't know how many generations it may have taken for, you know, and I'm not trying to be offensive to anyone who would take offense, but when you read the uh, biographies of the uh, Virginia General Robert E. Lee, yeah, uh, when he was. Uh, a part of the faculty at Washington College, later to become Washington and Lee College. It was noted that he would walk the campus with tears in his eyes and would remark to fellow faculty members of his great desire to see these young men, this was a men's college at that time, come to a saving knowledge of the, sa of the Savior. What he prayed for and what he yearned for in his latter years, more than anything else, was for revival to take place in, on that campus. Uh, so 
Where are the generals of prayer? If we want to see a, a genuine move where people move out of darkness, out of evil, into the light, into righteousness, it's going to take prayer. That means that somebody, even during the dark hours where evil seems to prevail, that they do not lose heart. Do not become so discouraged and say, well, it's useless. This generation is a waste. We might as well just try to keep our own noses clean and hide in our righteous bunkers. That's not Yah's plan. Yah says, where are my fire watchers? Put some fire on the altar. Put some oil in those lamps and keep the light burning. Mm -hmm. I I want to make another statement regarding this this revival thing, Barry, and this one may be really off base. But, you know, the people are asking, well, where's the preaching? Is it possible that the Almighty stepped in and said, these young people have greater purpose than your irrelevant preaching? I'm stepping in. (laughs) Okay. Now, let me back that one up. I, I do a lot. I do quite a bit of work with young people these days, just a little bit. And, um, the statements that I receive over and over again from them is that most of what they've heard in the preaching is irrelevant to them. They want something that's relevant (coughs) and worship is the most relevant thing that they can get a time of worship that brings them to a true reality of the word. Worship opens up the word. Uh, remember that Yeshua still, you know, the, the word's still true that the Father is, work, is is desiring those that would worship in spirit and in truth. So if you're waiting for the truth to be brought forth, don't discredit the spirit that may be bringing that truth forth. I would just add to that, how many of our gatherings before the word is brought, we spend time in worship? Oh, I, I I go to places that don't have any. I mean, not late, not lately, because those people don't have me back. But I've literally <laughs> been to, <laughs> I, I've literally been to messianic congregations that have no. We don't do that because that's Christian. No, that's biblical. Worship is biblical, and uh, you know, worship is what is what opens the door to to his to his truth i i believe now i mean it's the two it's not it's not either or um so barry with this i, I want one more thing you know i mentioned to you last week we were talking about the tabernacle and again i've i've taught on the tabernacle once or twice and and every time every time i do there's 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 revelation last week the revelation that i that i got uh, regarding the tabernacle was where did the original the, the, where did the loaves of bread come from in the wilderness? Well, they weren't going down to, you know, down to Safeway or, or Walmart and buying it. The, they, they, weren't, they weren't growing wheat, uh, but they were sure getting manna from the heavens. So was the, the origin of the showbread in the wilderness manna? Yeah. Think about that one for a while. And here's the next one. This week's Torah portion talks about the altar of incense. Um, The altar of incense, you put incense on that altar and it burned. And that burning produced smoke, which is seen in the book of Revelation as the prayers of the Zedekim, the saints. So in the tabernacle, the altar of incense was a picture of the people you're talking about the people of prayer but where did the wood come from where did the wood where did the coals come from for to be placed upon the altar of incense so the incense would be burned that wood came from the blood stained wood of the altar. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, the coals for the in- altar of incense was sourced from the brazen altar. Yes, which is blood stained wood. <clears throat> the purpose of the brazen altar is elevation. Yeah. An animal that is just a common and ordinary animal in the field, deemed to be flawless in its form, qualified to go to the altar. It wasn't that you killed the animal, but you elevated it from a common animal to that which was set apart. It wasn't taking the life, it was releasing the life. When the blood was taken out of the animal and placed on that altar, sprinkled against its sides, that blood became elevated in its purpose, in its calling. The animal offered was elevated to um, set-apart status and, and, and a means of near approaching, a korban, approaching close to the Most High. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's fat. And its burning of the fat was a well-pleasing aroma. And, you know, if we were to smell an animal hide burning or an animal carcass burning, it's not like you're smelling steaks on the grill. No, it's totally the opposite. Uh, There is, But Yah says, that aroma is pleasing to me. It's not the essence of the smell. It is the elevation of of the heart, mind, and spirit Mm -hmm. of the one who presents the offering, Mm -hmm. that it says, I'm just trying to get close to you. I want to draw near to you. Yeah. The coals then that you're referencing there have received the residual parts. The ashes fall down. The dripping of the fat comes down. The remnants of blood falls down. It is an offering. These are coals that have absorbed elevation so that then when they are placed upon the altar of incense, they continue their elevation effect. They're lifting up. They're causing the lifting up of the prayers and intercessions of those who believe. So could we see it like this, Barry, that, you know, anybody can pray. I mean, you know, uh, it, it, there, there's... The Father hears everyone. The Creator hears everything that everything every word that's called out to Him is heard by Him. But then there's the prayer of the Zedekim. You cannot you the the prayer of the Zedekim is the prayer that came with its origin upon, and I'll use those the, the words again. The origin of the prayer was the blood-stained wood, the execution stake of Messiah, the blood of Messiah upon an execution stake changes the status of our prayer from just those calling to him to those that are in relationship with him. And those prayers are the ones that will be poured out. Those are the prayers that are that are stored up for the end days. I'll finish with this. Yaakov or James 5, 16, the earnest prayer of a righteous one, a, sad, a sadiq, accomplishes much. Mm-hmm. So when we ask people to pray, help me pray about this situation. And we know you go on Facebook, everybody pray about this. The rabbinical understanding is that there is scales. The accuser of the brethren is hurling assaults of accusation, intimidation, threats against us. But then the prayers of the saints began to add on the opposite side until the scales are tipped in our favor. And Yah answers in our behalf. The greatest of the Sedekim is Yeshua, who when we call on him, takes his faint his thumb on our side of the scales and pushes them down 
so that our prayers are answered and the accusations of the evil one is not accepted against us. Yeah. Mm. So All right. the you want you want the set again to pray for you. Their prayer is heavy in mm -hmm. the scales in our behalf. Yep. Thanks everyone for watching Foundations for Life. Maybe you got stirred to a thought. Um, pray for revival to continue to be outpoured to have uh, righteous fruit and uh, pray for us that we will be effective in our ministries and the things that we try to do. Uh, thank you for your questions, your comments. Viewership is up. Thank you for that. Feel free to share, uh, put on your social media, send somebody an email and said, you ought to check this out. Even yep. if it's to argue a bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Send all the arguments to Barry Phillips. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> folks, if you can help us out with uh, with the need of the with Brett and his wife, uh, this is you, you wonder if there's legitimate. Uh, you know what's legit out there? Believe me, this one's legit. I will I will stake my reputation on these people and this need. You said go to your Facebook page. Can they also find information at your website? No, it's not on my website. They can go to my Facebook post that's on there, uh, or they can send me an email, and I'd be glad to. Uh, uh, I'll be glad to send the direct link. Uh, maybe you could even. I'll, I'll send you the, the direct link. Maybe you post it on the uh, uh, when when you send this out on YouTube today. Okay, we'll do that. Okay, I'll send that to you right away. All right. All right. Blessings, everyone. See you, man.